Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Revisit, and I'm very excited. An old friend of mine that, God, it goes back, I've known him for a while, and I don't want to drag him down memory lane, because he's dra- then he ends up dragging me down memory lane, and look, we, we just don't want to go down memory lane anymore. But uh, my good friend Bobby Moynihan, who is now at uh, the, the lovely Harlem Huskies head coach, and my friend, good to see you. Uh, like we said, yeah. I haven't seen you in a while, but, uh, you know, we both survived this damn thing. And uh, I- I'm thrilled we're on the eve of the first day of practice and actually able to talk some football because a lot for a long time there, my friend, it wasn't looking real good. No, it really wasn't. I, I kept telling our kids to uh, keep the faith, and I think that uh, eventually we'll be able to play, and and obviously that came to fruition. Our kids did a great job uh, during the COVID. We were able to lift uh, with masks on throughout the summer, but we could only have 10 kids in the weight room at a time. So we went from uh, 7 in the morning till 7 at night, and our kids made it work. Our coaches made it work. <laughs> Um, you could only have 10. So it was nine kids and one coach up there. And, yep. you know, so they stayed with it. So our kids have stayed real diligent and it's, it's kind of uh, turned into a commitment for them. And that, it, we've seen the games. They're huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's one of the, and there's so many different interesting spinoffs of having the spring season. I think that's one of it that you, you're going to have kids. And I mean, we'll get into some of your players. I, I think you're a quarterback right off the top who, is a kid that has been so productive on the field, and then just physically, he's probably a lot looking different now than he would have been back in August, September. Oh, he he's definitely. I, I don't know if you've seen him at any of the showcases. He's completely transformed his body. James has done a great job with that. People wanted to see him as a dual threat, and I think they're going to see that. They're going to see a, a real strong dual threat out of him, and he'll be he'll be fun to watch. Um. Going back over all this, I mean, let's face it. I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. No one had a playbook on this thing. No one. I mean, it was by trial and error. Knowing you, you probably had two dozen different plans all ready to go. Had to scrap them all and start over again. How big of a challenge was it just trying to keep a team together when it, you know, a good portion of this, they couldn't even be in school? How hard was that? Um. The one nice thing about we we've been um, hybrid the whole time. Okay, I've had some kids in and some out, but as far as let's go back to last March, it was extremely difficult because we were having some just massive gains in the weight room. They were becoming committed, and uh, we were beginning to worry that is that commitment going to hide? And you know how when you're and and Harlem's been a good program. It's just we we had to get stronger. We learned that when we played Wheat Moore and Bill South. Yeah. I knew what we were going to get. Yep. Um, our kids found out what we were going to get. And the one thing I told them at the end of that game was, we were out muscled tonight. That can't happen again. And our kids got serious. I mean, they got – we've had just some unreal numbers in the weight room, stuff you just don't – I've never – I'm going to be honest. I've been doing this a long time. You and I, we go down back, back down memory lane. Yep. I've never had a sophomore power clean 315 pounds. Never. It's awesome. And – here yeah. they but they committed to the weight room and they found places when we got you know put into oh you're back in the quarantine again and i think that happened twice to us in that time with those different times and both times our kids they just found places where they could work and i would think that was the biggest culture change that i've seen is that they it, at first we were worried as coaches is it going to make them separate this COVID thing. Yeah. But I think it really brought our team together. We became, instead of a me, 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 we were becoming a we, we, we. And well, it's cool to watch. And and it's one of those, Bobby, where, you know, I don't think, and, and I don't think they ever took it for granted, but I, I think we're going to see a whole brand new mentality this spring of kids that are truly going to embrace every single minute they're out there, especially your seniors. They, you know, you had that taken away and, and and you saw how kids reacted. It was rough. I mean, yeah. it, it was, hey, trust me, it was rough on coaches and, and media and everyone else. But those kids really paid the price. And, and you know, just the kids that I talk to now, it's it's just a it's almost like a rebirth, a rejuvenation where they're like, hey, I just I just can't wait to get out there with my teammates and like just practice. 
we we just want to get out there and practice again and work at it. That's what I'm most excited about with the short and spring season is not that it wasn't there before, but I think we're going to even see more so just a flat out love for the game this this spring. And, and I think that was due right now because I think that was that was waning a little bit. I think more people were worried more about what they were doing and what, you know, oh, this guy's getting this. I'm worried about that. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think they want to they, – they genuinely love each other now and they want to play for the, the love of the game. And I think that's a cool thing that's come out of this a little bit. It's amazing when something gets taken away from you. Mm-hmm. How, how you react. And, and again, I don't think you could ask kids to react any better. And Bobby, I talk to people about this all the time. And I've said this a few times before, and I know you've got a thought on it. You know, we've, we as a generation, you and me have been talking about the millennials and everyone else and all oh, their soft and all the technology and you know, you've got it so much easier. And Bobby, you and I walked uphill both ways to school in the snow with no shoes. And yeah, but the thing I'll, I'll say this, and I'll continue to say it, after what all these kids have been through with this pandemic and the way they've handled it and handled their business, man, I'll never say anything like that ever again about these kids. These kids have been phenomenal and sticking to it and getting after it. And, and just online schooling alone that they've had to deal with. And, and obviously the teachers and everyone else that had to pitch in. But for, for these young kids – had their lives completely jacked around because of this and to adjust and still be getting it done. I, I give those kids a ton of credit. Oh, I, I tell them that every day. I, I mean, I said, you know, we can sit here and we can say, we've done this, we've done that, we've done that. We've never been through a pandemic, guys. When we grew up, this didn't happen. Um, unfortunately, we're living through something that we can't even explain because we weren't, we've never seen it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. The, I do, I give them. Just I, I talk to them about it every day that the the tenacity that they have and the love and you know they just they just want to be together and and that's the hardest part about the whole thing you know it, it's the one thing we did trying trying to get them together because of the you know there's certain things we could do we we ran study halls yeah after after on Wednesday nights we did it through Zoom we did it through just so they could be together and talk so yeah. they could talk uh, up, get, just so we could do those things. And it, it worked out really well. I think the kids got to know us. We got to know them. And it, it just becomes a better atmosphere. Yeah. And and look, you got thrown into this. You're, you're in it together, whether you like it or not. And exactly. you're either going to sink, sink as individuals or, or rise up as a team and get through this. And obviously, we're seeing a lot of those stories. And I think we're going to continue to hear those stories as the spring goes along, which is great. Um, throughout your coaching career, you have always embraced the challenge. You oh. always have. You've been at some interesting stops along the way. They have never been what I would call ready-made jobs. This might be as close to one of those as you've had, I think, in your career at Harlem, but um, always a lot of work involved. So you've had those challenges. I mean, how big of a challenge was it this year having to deal with circumstances you just really had no control over? And, and, and it's one thing where – you know, with your program, you, you can control certain things and, and behaviors and, and grades and things. But when you have a pandemic like this where you don't know where it starts and when it's going to end and how it's going to end, was that probably as difficult as anything you've taken on in your career? I, I, I would say it is. I think the diff- I think those other things prepared me for it because there was a lot of, you know, you know those places I've been, so it's – it's been rough, but they, they, if you make it work and you find out ways, I think the biggest thing that shocked me more than anything was how things changed so rapidly. Um, and with that, some of our coaches didn't even understand how that would happen. And that, you know, it, it kind of got to them because they weren't used to it. You know, they might be in a business where things didn't change like that. And you had to roll that right off your back. But with those experiences like you're talking about that I've had, you've got to learn to let that roll off and not take it personal. You just got to say, you know, hey, this is the new today. We got to change it. So tomorrow we can do this. But the whole time we were doing this, we were we were just, I mean, we did a lot of fundraising. We did a lot of things together. And we said, we're going to have a season. We just don't know when it is. Yeah. And we we just kept pushing that, pushing that, pushing that with our kids. And But you're right. It, I think those other circumstances helped me out a great deal in working through this. Yeah. Because it was difficult. Yeah. 
Um, speaking of difficult and, and something that you've been great, as long as I've known you as a head coach, you are truly an, a vocal advocate for your kids. And, and you'll get in my face and tell me, hey, I got some guys here. And no, I love you for that. And and, and I love when coaches get involved because it does. It, it It definitely makes me take a second look. I mean, how difficult was this for you with your seniors trying to get these kids placed and get in places and a kid. And again, I'll keep referring to James Cooper Jr., a kid that might be one of the most productive quarterbacks in the state over the last three, four years. And, and he was, he was scrambling to find a spot. So, I mean, just incredibly difficult. And how hard was that for you really just to, to number one, explain to these kids why this is happening. Number two, trying to find homes for them. Uh, the biggest thing was, is trying to explain to them what was going on because as, as we all know now, everyone gets another year in college. Yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen to our kids in high school. So they're kind of stuck because the, the colleges have only so many scholarships they can offer. So these kids are like, wait a minute, why is it happening? It happened last year for this guy. Why isn't it happening for me? So that was hard for, to explain to them. And at first, we didn't understand it. Now we understand the whole complex behind the, the complexity behind it because it, it is. It's There's kids just – not going to graduate. They're going to go another year. Yeah. And that's the most difficult portion of it. And with James, James is a tremendous talent. Um, he's got, yeah. throws the ball well, and he will continue. Uh, there's a couple still on him. We'll see what happens with his, uh, they want to see him as a dual threat. I think they're going to see that this, uh, uh, this uh, spring. And I Oh, think- don't, don't reveal that playbook yet, coach. Oh, I don't know I can do it. I don't care. He's going to be a dual threat. I mean, he is. He, we know it. We're still going to RPO people. And, yeah. You know, that's what we do. But it, it'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so before we get into this team mm-hmm. and what you got this spring, let's talk about the Nick 10 a little bit. And it's it's a conference that, first of all, I thought 2019 was a good year. You got five teams into the playoffs. Uh, Boylan, Hananega both advanced. Um, something that hadn't happened in a while in the Nick 10. Nick 10 had kind of been quiet come playoff time. You've, you, again, we talk about you've been all over, you've seen football all, all over the state. Talk up your conference to me. What is it about this Nick 10 that maybe a lot of people miss and sleep on, maybe pretty consistently, it seems like, anyway? I, th- I think it's very talented. Um, I think there's a, a group, it's, it's really well rounded, so to speak because you've got some great linemen that come through here. I had a kid last year. Here's here's where the difficulty comes in. I had a kid last year who had, I think it was 39 tackles for a loss, a defensive end, but he didn't want to go on and play college football. Uh-huh. Now, he could have went somewhere. Yeah, 6'3", strong, fast, just a great kid. But I think that's what you see a lot out of the Nick Ted. We're still a blue-collar city, so a lot of our kids, they, they want to go weld. They want to go do the things that yeah. – aren't there so they maybe don't get as much attention as they should but the ones that are coming out that want to play football uh the commitment levels there the talents there um i think sometimes we get taken for granted i think the coaching uh up here is excellent um you know and they're doing a great job you're going to see some good things come out of several of the uh, rockford public schools this year um i think you know the big three will still be the big three um but you're going to see some neat stuff happening up here. It's good, and it'll it'll transform. It really will. And and you know, I, I, the conference as a whole is very competitive. Could it be broken into two? Probably. Well, in a- that, that's where we're going next. Right. I'm taking you down that road next. I know. I know. <laughs> I figured as well. So so you know, and and again, people ask, and you see my message board, and they ask all the time, well, "What about the Nick 10? And my whole thing for years, and, and it's it's the age old argument. The lock conference. I mean, and, and does one or two non-conference game mean all the world to, to your area? I don't know. But all I know is is I think if you guys had that one or two non-conference game to be able to go out and play some teams across the state, I just think I think it would give – and you talk about your kids learning that lesson in the playoffs. Boy, I would love to see you guys learn that lesson in week one or week two of a regular season as opposed to week ten. And I think that's a big part of it, Bobby. I really do. I would I would agree 100. percent I I'm uh, obviously you know I'm an advocate of playing the toughest competition we could possibly yep. play, um, and I would love to have a couple of 
preseason or, or preliminary conference games, non-cons that, you know, we pick some of the, the big 7A schools that I know are going to be uh, good year in and year out. So that way it allows our kids to understand this is who you're competing against. You may not be competing against that guy across town. These are the guys you're competing, and these are the guys you're competing for with scholarship money. Yeah, exactly. and I think that's what happens. You know, you you asked about the Big Ten. I think when colleges look, they might see us play a game that we should win. Yeah, and they're like, well, there's the stats. No, no, the stats aren't just there; they're everywhere. And and maybe some of the teams don't get as much credit as they deserve, but you know, they're they're pretty solid teams. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. just as an example, that five A semifinal game in Saint Rita. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Boylan hung with them for a long time in that ball game, and and, and I think that opened a lot of eyes. And people said, "Hey, you know what? Boy, it looks like Boylan might be back." You know, compared to maybe where they were, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Hey, look, you know, it's a pretty good team, and, and and I think that just does a world of good for your conference when you get those kind of matchups. And you know, I, I, I as we said, I, I just think it gives your kids that that okay, hey, this is where we really need to get to, and. And it gives them that kind of kind of call, wake up call a little bit earlier down the road. So, so let's talk about your team. What you got coming back in in, in twenty twenty one here in the spring? We we talked already about him about James Cooper Jr. Start with him and give us some other names that uh, people are going to need to get to know this uh, coming spring. I'll give you a couple more offensive players that are three. I'll give you right off the gate on uh, skill kids. Uh, Dominic McCarron um, again. Don't know what he's going to do after high school. He's a six three kid. I had Iowa State looking at him. NIU doesn't really know if he wants to play college football. Um, so there's there's a again one of the, the issues. Yep. Uh, solid receiver. He's six three. Runs a four seven. He's he's going to be good. Um, hopefully, he decides he wants to play college football. We'll see. Yep. Um, we got Desi Jordan. He's six four. Runs a four four. Yep. And he catches the ball well, plays corner for us as well. He's going to be a newcomer that you're going to see that's just tremendous. And then we got Palos. Palos is a uh, unique individual. He's a uh, he he's a, he's a beast. He's a big unique individual. Ah, uh, yes, he is. He's a uh, he's probably the trendsetter in the weight room, and it's only helped the young kid that you, everyone's hearing about this McKinney kid whose brother played for TCU. They work out together. They work hard. They've set the tone in the weight room. Um, and I would say, Paulos, he'll be our running back. He's a, You're, you're going to see some things out of him. You saw him against Wheaton Warrenville, but that's when he was a 190-pound kid. And, a little bigger now. And was benching 205 and yep. squatting 315. Now he's squatting 505, and he's benching 345, and he's 330, or 230 pounds. So he's he's just a big kid, and he plays middle linebacker for us too. He made all state uh, last year as a linebacker, um, and he had over 100 tackles his freshman year. Had 97 last year. He's a tackling machine, and he's really really good. So he'll be on the offensive side and the defensive side. Um, our offensive line is just so much better, and I know that's your favorite part of the yep. team. And what they've done is uh, our weakest guy now is, is is stronger than our strongest kid last year. Awesome. So our strongest kid last year benched 275, squatted around 400. They're all well past that. So our offensive line is bigger, stronger, um, and better. So that'll help out with Cooper. That'll help out with Palos. Uh, we got a great receiving core. We got a young little slot receiver, Ishman. He's a senior. He's a burner, and he'll be – he's real well – he did excellent. He has a thousand pound club. He just hit that thousand pound club as a wide receiver on the four list. And what we do up there is we we do a single rep max. So we're not going to say you know he did three right. reps. But we're going to guess it's this. No, they had to put it up. Yeah. So it is. Those are legit maxes. Um, then then the sophomore we got you know he he's a pretty solid kid. Um, McKinney he's uh, he's going to be a monster at nose guard. Um, We'll also play him at some H and some fullback. And he's 6'2", 280, and uh, has set every record we have at the school. He's uh, 1,900 pounds in the uh, four lifts uh, as a sophomore. So he's yeah. just – he's on it. Kid, yeah. Always on it. Uh, we got a couple of good uh, – I got a little safety um, who's done a great job. Uh, 
Ethan Taylor. He's a uh, junior as well. We're very junior-oriented and sophomore-oriented, along with our senior class. The studs we have in the senior class have been complemented with the two younger classes. But Ethan Taylor's a safety. Uh, again, he's benched 315, and he's only 170 pounds. So he did 1,700 pounds, and he's only 17. He's only 170 pounds. Yeah. So yeah. he's a strong kid, fast kid. He runs a 4'6". So – these guys all put it in. Um, Ty, I think it was Ty Tyus who, who said it originally. Coach, I know you said that we all have to bench 185, but we're all going to bench 225 <laughs> to play on defense. Sure. <laughs> hey, this is a 138-pound kid. Yeah. And he did it. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it's just that's the type of mentality they have right now. You said no one can run under uh, – everyone has to be under a five. That's what it is. Everyone's got to be 4'9 or better. Um, they, they have to be benching according to the team. Um, so our entire secondary is over 225. Um, so it's pretty nice. I mean, it's really nice. Uh, Jack Hoffman's going to be a monster. And he's only a junior. Again, a lot of these kids are juniors. Yep. They're really young. Um, Jack Hoffman's a defensive end. Reed Foster, he's a uh, middle linebacker with with uh, Paulus. We run a 3-4, and we do a lot of different things out of it. And he, he's, again, he's another kid who's up there at 275. I mean, these kids are just they, – they love the way – this junior class, we knew it was coming. We knew they were going to meld well with what we had in our senior class. Do we miss that we didn't have a season? Yes, we do. Because <laughs> now we have some chances of doing some pretty yep. cool things. Uh, but we'll have it this year. And, again, you know, it'll change a little bit because our seniors are gone. But next year it'll be good. But those are probably uh, the toughest kids other than – we also had a transfer that came down from Beloit by the name of Brennan McCoy. He's a big offensive lineman who's uh, he's about 6'3", and he goes 300. And, again, he's up there with those guys in those bench press numbers and squat numbers. And you'll always you'll always welcome that 6'3", 300-pound transfer any day of the week. Oh, yeah. If there's more out there, they want to come on over. Come on over. Yeah. But, I mean, we built some good ones. I mean, we got some – yeah. you know, he, he's – he came in last. I think it's. I was just looking. He was benching last February, 185 pounds. He hit 265. So I mean, these kids have really just come on strong, and these are young kids that'll be fighting some of those other. That's, kids. that's what's exciting because yeah. besides the spring, you know, this is in in a lot of ways, Bobby. Let's face it. This oh. is like this is like the spring we always dreamed that we would have in Illinois, where you would have like legitimate spring ball. To get ready for the fall, and this is exactly what it is. So that's why I want to ask you: Does that change your approach a little bit with the six games? Is it? Are you trying to find a happy medium where, yeah, you're seniors, and, and I'm talking about the kids that are seniors that maybe didn't play a ton. Are, are, is it get them time priority one, or are you kind of juggling between all these young kids you want to get some seat time and, and getting after? It's kind of what's your approach going in uh, to the season. What we're trying to do is we're, we want to reward our seniors because, again, like you said, no one's been through this. Yeah. And these kids have been – I mean, I hate to say it like this, but they've been crapped on yeah. since March of last yeah. year. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to make sure that we're promoting them as well as we can while gelling our younger class, if that makes sense. In a well, way. it does. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to play as many kids as we want. I think that's one great thing about the spring because it really – I mean, we're going to play for a bowl game up here, but does it really – it's not like you're playing for that state championship. So can we get some kids in and maybe where we might have only played five defensive linemen, maybe we play six or seven. Seven or eight, yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So th those are the things that we're looking at as a whole just to try to develop everyone, but we don't want to take it away from our seniors. Because so I, I've tried finding your schedule and I've had no luck. So do you have your schedule in front of you? Yes, I do. What is it? We start off at Auburn, and that's a Friday night game. That's our only Friday night game. Uh, that's March 19th at Auburn. Then we go to – or Freeport comes to us, and that's on a Saturday at 1 o'clock. Then yeah. Belvedere North, I think that was good – or Holy Saturday. Yeah. Because we didn't want to play on Good, uh, good, good Friday. Actually, yeah. their place. They didn't want to play on Good Friday. We didn't want to play on Good Friday. So we said, okay, we'll do Saturday there. And we're doing that at 2.15 at their place. 
Um, and then uh, after that comes Hano. <laughs> and Piece of cake. <laughs> Piece of cake game for you, sure. Yeah, we'll be that. That's the one they're looking at. The, the, the next one's the one they're really looking for. Um, so well, Hano at our place at uh, one o'clock, and then we got uh, Boiler at our place at one o'clock. Nice. So those are. Yeah, and then how's the bowl, how's the bowl game going to work? How the they bowl, set it up? Yeah, what they're doing is. Um, we split the conference into two. Okay. Right? So we have one side and another side. Uh, our side is uh, uh, us, Belvedere North, Hananiga, uh, Boylan, and Auburn. And okay. then the other side, obviously. So our crossover was Freeport this year or this spring. And then um, everyone else has a crossover. So what will happen is whoever wins each side. Yep. Ones will play ones, twos will play twos, threes, fours, and five. That's great. That's right. great. I would, and that that's what I was hoping with all this. When when all this when this came down, I was like, you know what? Have some fun. You know, get creative with this and and do some different things. You just mentioned you split the conference in two. Maybe this is something you guys look at again and go, hey, you know what? Maybe we can work with this a little bit and. You know, and not just for the reasons I said, but maybe benefits as well. Maybe it balances out the conferences a little bit. I mean, it, it there, there could be worse things that could happen because of this. Exactly. I, I think it would be great. I, I think it would be great if we could add to, you know. Yeah. Um, if we could add to, we could have six and six and have two um, non-cons and a crossover. And, and the other thing I want to add, too, that I don't know if people are aware of this or not, but um, you're going to be able to find a lot of high school football in the Rockford area because besides, as you mentioned, we're going to get a lot of scheduling changes and venues are going to change. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to throw in, as we talked about, the NUIC schools. A lot of them are coming to Freeport in your place and playing their home games. Well, I might get a town a townhouse up in Rockford and just hang out because because there's going to be a lot of football this spring up in Rockford. There's going to be a lot of football at Harlem High School. Yeah, we have rented it out for everything. That's uh, great. You're though. That's great. there, you're gonna. I mean, you're gonna see everyone there. Yeah, Boy, there. Uh, it's we've rented it out and they, and they gave them a great price. They didn't try to yeah. gout anything. Yeah. They, I mean, they gave it well under what the value is. Just because they want to help it, you know exactly. that's cool. and, um, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Seriously, no. with with the Rockford area schools and the Nick Ten, right. no, all good people, all good programs, and in a situation like this, like you said, are, are all hands on deck, and and let's pull it off. So hey, it'll be fun. It'll be Friday nights. We'll be going yeah. to walk through. We'll go up in our stands and we'll watch Bago. We'll watch Byron. We'll we'll get to yeah. see some cool stuff. Yeah, no okay. doubt. Um, hey, great to see you. Good to get caught up. And uh, I don't know, man, you're tempting me. You might just see me now. See, my my spring's going to be different than what it usually is. I have no TV responsibilities this spring season. So so I am unleashed. We'd love to see I you. I go anywhere I want to go this spring, pal. Come anywhere. to Maryland or Hano. Those would be the those would be fun ones to come. I to. might just spend a weekend up there. You never know. That's awesome. Belvedere North. They're yep. good this year they're going to be real good. Yeah, well, that'll yeah. be a nice one too. Anyway. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And and again, just uh, great to get caught up. And this won't be the last time. We'll definitely stay in touch. And uh, wish you the best. Stay healthy and uh, go get them. Have fun tomorrow. You too, buddy.